Well, once again, good morning. I hope you have your Bibles with you. I invite you to turn with me to the book of James. And we're going to begin this morning our study of the book of James. And uh, looking forward, both Brandon and I, Pastor Brandon, looking forward to preaching through this wonderful book. And as I mentioned earlier, encourage you to get connected in our uh, various community group offerings so you can have a chance to discuss uh, God's Word as we, uh, as we delve into such a practical, practical book. In fact, uh, as we begin this study, the first thing just to note is uh, most believe that the James in referenced here is uh, the brother of Jesus, half-brother of Jesus, and, uh, and he's writing, he identifies himself as a servant of God. Let's look together, James chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. And then note, as soon as he's kind of introduced himself and started his letter, <laughs> he jumps right to the point. I mean, I've never seen uh, someone move so quickly to a very relevant point. He says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person, <clears throat> excuse me, that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. But the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. It blossoms fell, and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Now, as I said, it's important that we first get kind of the context here of who James is writing to. James being a half-brother to Jesus, obviously a Jew. And when he talks about writing to the 12 tribes throughout the nations, basically understand that because of the conflict with the Romans, the Romans have pretty much come into Jerusalem, into Palestine, that whole area that we now know as Israel, and, and Rome's kind of taking over and kind of squashing down the church. And so these Jewish Christians began to scatter. And so when he references scattered all these nations, he's basically writing to people who have fled. And as a result of the, uh, of the battle and the conflict with Rome, they're going through some hardships. And so that's why immediately he just jumps right into his point. As soon as he introduces himself and basically says, hi, it's me, he starts in to consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. He's answering the question that every one of us have had at some point in our life. What's the question? Why? Why is this happening to me? That question's often followed up very quickly with the next one, and that is, where are you, God? And you can begin to doubt as he talks about this person being double-minded. You begin to think two different ways. Like one way is I, I think there is a God. The other side, oh, I'm not so sure. He says you start getting blown around, tossed back and forth like the sea, the waves of the sea. Why? Where are you, God? Every one of us in some way or another know what it is to wrestle with those two questions. If you haven't if you don't find yourself there today because of some circumstances playing out, either a diagnosis, some failure in a relationship or in business, then you probably can give testimony to not that long ago you came through a very difficult time. And if neither of those fit you, well, I hope it's not bad news to let you in on a secret. You, you may be headed into one of those times. <laughs> Because the truth is, all of us, it's a part of life, we're going to deal with things that cause us to question why and where are you, God? In fact, I've listed there in your sermon outline four realities of life 
<clears throat> excuse me, these four realities you see there in those bullet points, every one of us are going to deal with. Let's just define them kind of loosely. There's trouble, and that's the result of my own choices and sinfulness. I've often said if I could kick the behind of the person that caused the most trouble in my life, I wouldn't be able to sit down for a week, right? I mean, the reality is many times our own choices cause for us trouble. In fact, Proverbs talks about how we can make bad choices and then blame God for them oftentimes and just as we deal with the consequences of our own choices and sinfulness. The second part is trespasses. That's the result of, result of choices and sins of others. And that one's probably easier for us to identify. Many of you here this morning could probably uh, may be dealing with the, the reality that someone has sinned against you. Someone has hurt you. Their actions are impacting you in some negative ways. That's a reality of life. We're going to have that happen. Well, let's just refer to those as trespasses. And then the Bible plainly teaches that there are also tests. Now, this is where it gets a little bit confusing because tests can be a combination of all these things. It's not like these categories are always so uh, separated out in our lives. We don't always experience them so compartmentalized. I mean, sometimes the trespass against us may be because of our own choice. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm surprised sometimes at, at uh, how folks... Um, like, anybody ever stop to read some of the stuff on the internet, uh, like when they have an article and then people discuss it? Maybe it's political things. And I always think when I'm reading that, like, life is short. Spend a lot of time arguing with a stranger on the internet. I, <laughs> I don't, there's just certain things I don't get. Like, I don't understand that. But, but, but sometimes some of the trouble we bring on ourselves, some of the trespasses, it can be some of our own choices and then the choices of others. And we just get, it gets all tangled up. But the Bible plainly teaches that God brings before us tests. That we go through times of testing. And these are designed by God to draw us near to God and to strengthen our faith. In other words, God provides these tests, these opportunities. But from God's perspective, they're designed to, turn, to cause us to turn to Him. Many of you could probably give testimony to times that maybe you were distant from God, didn't, God wasn't important in your life, just kind of going about your own way. And then one of these things, something happened in your life, and all of a sudden you found that bringing you back to God in a very real way, turning to God, drawing near to God, praying for God's strength, grace, and help. And so that you might have experienced like a test where God is strengthening our faith. And then the final was temptation. We all deal with temptation. James is going to deal with that. We're not going to talk about that so much today because there's some more passages coming up where he'll deal with that in more depth. But basically, a temptation is designed by Satan to draw me away from God and destroy my faith. And many times, these two are often real close together. The test and the temptation can almost be like two sides of a coin. It all has to, depends on how you approach it, how you handle it, who you look to. It's almost like how the movies often portray the the guy has the angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other shoulder and they're talking to you, you know, and many of you can maybe relate to those situations. You may be experiencing it as a test if you're looking to God or a temptation if you're listening to the devil. But these are realities that we're all going to deal with in life and all of these have the potential to take us to places where we ask the question, why and where are you, God? So I want to share with you some points this morning as, as I... Uh, experience God working in my life in situations like this. And these are some things that uh, hopefully God can speak to you as well. What does it look like to rejoice in the midst of testing and trials like James talks about here? At first glance, we might just say, James, uh, <laughs> I think you're out of your mind, man. You've been in the sun too long. What are you even talking about rejoicing in the midst? Consider it pure joy in the midst of testing and trials. How do you do that? And if you're interested in, in how to do that, let me share with you some things that, that God is teaching me. First of all, it's about recognizing Jesus as Lord. The first thing you have to do is recognize that Jesus is Lord. Now, the reason this is key is because when we're, what we're talking about is trying to understand where God is, right? So if you're saying, why is this happening and where are you, God? If those are the questions, then one of the first things you've got to understand is what God has done. The Bible has made it very clear. And this sometimes gets confusing for people. But this is very clear. The Bible says, God has made Jesus Lord. It's a done deal. <laughs> so in that sense, is Jesus Lord? Yes. 
because God made him Lord. But now let's get down to the practical level. That's where James is really going to spend his time focused. God has made Jesus Lord. The question is, do we recognize what God has done? I mean, if you're going to understand where God is and you're going to understand what God's up to and you're trying to understand the why, you must first understand that God is working in the world. And one of the things that God has done, a primary thing that God has done, is He has made Jesus Lord. And so if we're going to understand God at all, we have to recognize what God has done in Jesus Christ, that Jesus is, in fact, Lord. That's why it becomes the first step. Notice, in, as you read James, uh, I've even put the passages there for it. James 1, he says, I'm a servant of God and of what? Lord Jesus Christ. He even identifies himself that way. It's part of how he introduces himself. He's so connected to Jesus as Lord, that's how he introduces himself. A little later in the same passage, he says, uh, you could be double-minded because that one doubts. And then he says, that person should not expect to receive anything from who? From the Lord. Clearly, the Lord's a part of his whole discussion. He gets a little further down that same passage. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, having stood the test. That person will receive the crown of life that who has promised? The Lord. It's just so much a part of his language. He has clearly recognized that Jesus is Lord. The question is, have you? Doesn't change the fact of who Jesus is. He's still Lord. The question is, do we know what it is to recognize him? As Lord. Let me help you out with that a little bit. Last week, we had a, two people come to be baptized. And in being baptized, in essence, they're professing Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, they'll have to put that into practice as they start living that out. But the reason baptism becomes so important, is let me ask you a simple question. How many of you like getting up in front of a church full of people and being dunked in water? <laughs> like you just say, man, I wish I could do that. I just would love. To. Not many. So why does anybody do it? Because Jesus is Lord. And I'm convinced one of the first things Jesus asked us to do, it's almost like he's just testing to see, are you going to recognize me as Lord of your life? I'm going to ask you to do something. And I want to see how you respond. And I cannot tell you, I've pastored long, I cannot tell you all the people who make excuses for why they don't have to be baptized or shouldn't be baptized or is it okay if I don't be baptized? And we talk about that thief on the cross. <laughs> how many of you want to go to heaven like the thief on the cross, right? Is that your goal in life? Man, I want to be like that guy. He didn't have to be baptized. Let me encourage you. If you want to know how to rejoice in the midst of hardships, trials and temptations, recognize Jesus is Lord. Stop making excuses and take that step. Trust Him. Get baptized. Here's why it's important. You say, why is that so important? I'm glad you asked. I was really hoping you'd ask that. Because if you're going to be able to navigate and find your way through hardships, trials, and tests, guess who you're going to need to listen to? The Lord. Thank you. Exactly. It, it's no different. That's what's so neat about our GPSs. How many of you have genuinely, and I mean genuinely, been lost? Every guy in here could raise his hand. But, you know, just... I mean, you didn't know where you were. Some circumstance, you were in a strange... You literally, in that moment, you know you were lost. And you pulled your phone out. And maybe you were even surprised when the GPS started telling you to go away. You thought, you're like, man, I had it completely backwards. I thought, I thought that was the direction. And they're turning me around to go the other way. If you've ever been in that situation, then you know what it, need, what it means to need Jesus as Lord. Because I'm going to tell you, in the midst of hardships and trials and times of testing, you can become so lost, you don't know which way's up and which way's down. You don't know which way to turn and where to take the next step. And it's in that moment, you need to know what it is to recognize the one who's Lord so you can listen. And he's going to start telling you some things. And when he tells you, you're going to know it's his voice. Because your first instinct is, no way. That can't be right. And it's in that moment 
that you have the opportunity to discover just how lost you really are. Just how turned around you really are. Just how confused you really are. Can I give you an example? Let's say the trial you're going through is because someone has hurt you. They trespassed against you. Their sin has impacted you in some significant major ways. And everything in you wants to be angry at them, wants to be mad at them, wants to hold that grudge. And then Jesus, the Lord, says, I want you to have a grudge sale. And you're like, no, 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 no. I'm holding on to all this stuff. Anybody know what it is to keep a lot of junk around, you know, to too much? You just, no, I need all this stuff. I'm holding all of it. <laughs> Don't miss this. And Jesus says, I already paid for it all. I already paid the price. I bought it all. I want you to throw all that away. And forgive them. Tell me that doesn't cause you to have to turn in a different direction. And many times we say, uh uh, I'm gonna hold on to this stuff. I just wonder in a crowd this size, any testimonies here today about how God's brought you to a place you realize if you'd have forgiven a long time ago, you'd be in a far better place? That you realize you just held on to stuff and it just was, the enemy was simply using that stuff to rob you of life. That's why it's important to recognize Jesus as Lord. He's the one who's going to speak to you with wisdom to help you navigate how you move forward in the midst of trials and testing. And once you start hearing his voice, I'm telling you, it's cause for rejoicing. Because you know he knows your way out. In that lost condition, it's just like when the GPS says to you, okay, turn here and you start getting confidence. Yes, I'm going in the right direction. Jesus will lead you out of whatever the enemies tried to hem you into. The second reason and what we need to understand about rejoicing in the midst of testing and trials is it's realizing that God has a purpose and a plan. Now, this is important. Once you recognize Jesus as Lord, it's about realizing that God has a, plan, a purpose and a plan for your pain. Let's look at Romans 8, 28. In fact, let's just read this together. How about you guys help me out? And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Working with God to create Christ-centered, loving family relationships, God's purpose is for us to become family, brothers and sisters. The firstborn was Jesus. It takes us all the way back to the very beginning. Where we're taught in Genesis 1, God said what? Let us make man, how? In our image. Here's what you need to know about God. He never changed his plan. He never changed his purpose. And so today, what we discover is God is working for good. That's why you need to recognize the Lord and listen to him. Because he's going to help bring good out of even the worst of situations. Now, please understand, it doesn't mean all situations are good. There's a lot of evil in this world. There's a lot that's not God's will that happens in this world. The promise of God is that God is working to accomplish good in the midst of those situations. And what good is it? This is what we have to define. Sometimes, we, well, God's working for good. What's the good God's working to accomplish? To make us more like Jesus. That's what he's trying to accomplish. So let me put it this way, in, if you want to understand God's purpose and God's plan in the midst of your pain so that you can rejoice, understand that the goal for God is to make you more like Jesus. Here's what I know. Every hardship I've gone through as a pastor, 
every challenge and difficult I've had to deal with in life has resulted in making me a better pastor. Gives me insight and understanding. Positions me to see and understand things I might not have understood before. God works to accomplish good as he seeks to make us more like Christ. So Peter kind of picks up the same theme. 1 Peter 4, he says, So then, those who suffer, you ready for this? According to God's will, ooh. Wait a second, Pastor. Is Peter saying that it could be God's will for you to suffer? Yeah, you could probably interpret it that way. I think a better way to interpret it is when he's saying, you're going to suffer. That's a, that's a given. You're going to face those four realities in life. Life is going to bring that to you. Do you know what it is to suffer according to God's will? You say, well, what would that be? Well, it's God's will that in the midst of your suffering and my suffering, in the midst of our pain, that we become more like Jesus. That's the goal. That's what God's working to do. And, and when you begin to see that and understand that, that even in the midst of painful situations, God has a purpose and He can bring forth and accomplish His purpose, it is cause for rejoicing. That's what James is trying to tell us. To those who are scattered abroad trying to understand, God, why is this happening to me? And where are you? The third thing that I think can help us rejoicing in the midst of testing and trials is responding with faith instead of reacting in fear. This is where our faith really comes into practice. This is what James is going to talk more and more about. James is very practical about not just saying you have faith, but practicing faith, exercising faith. And James is saying it's in the midst of that hardship, in the midst of that difficulty, what does it mean to respond with faith in that moment? And here's what I know. In the midst of hardships, in the midst of difficulties, if you are going to respond with faith, it means you will have to overcome the fear associated with that event. The enemy wants to paralyze us with fear. And that's where faith comes in. We have to overcome fear with our faith. How many of you know that most everything you want in life is on the other side of fear? And the reason that's true is because the enemy uses fear in such a powerful way to kind of keep us stuck in places that God desires us not to remain stuck. And so we have to put our faith into practice. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 can help us. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. Why is it that we're encouraged to not lean on our own understanding? It's very simple. Because in the midst of these difficult hardships, we're not going to understand. There's going to be a lot of things we are just not able to understand. And that's why we need to practice our faith. In all your ways, submit to God and God will make your path straight. Notice he didn't say easy. He said straight. You might want to circle that straight. God's not saying I'm going to make the path easy for you, but I'm going to make it straight. You're going to be able to see where I want you to go to take that next step of faith. I'll straighten it out for you. Paul reminded the church at Corinth, we walk by faith and not by sight. In Hebrews eleven six. 6, without faith it is impossible to please God. Anyone who comes to God must believe that God exists. That's the first part. And that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. The idea behind earnestly there that not, it's not easy, but we seek him. And now we're talking about that reward. You might want to circle that word reward because the last point is one I think is kind of neat. And it's receiving the crown of life. Notice in verse 12, James talks about blessed. How many of you know that God wants to bless us? And I'm going to tell you as a pastor, I'm convinced of this. Whether we use this language or not or even understand it, what you really want in life is the blessing of God. You may, not, you may not use that language to understand what that even means, but the blessing of God is what we want. And so, uh, James makes reference to a crown. So what I did is I brought my crown. This is the one I wear around the house. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that didn't work either. So let me, let me just set that down. All right, I've got this one here because uh, I would wear this one with pride. I want to show you the difference. We think a crown, sometimes we think of like royalty, like, like authority and power. That is not the crown that's being referenced here when James says that the Lord wants to bless us with a crown of life. It's interesting we would talk about this on Super Bowl Sunday. Because what this represents would be a crown like uh, in the early days would have been given in the Olympics. You may have seen them. If you, if you were victorious in the Olympics, you were, you were given a crown that you would, you would wear like this. And it would be your way of identifying, I was victorious. I overcame. Okay, you're taking pictures. So I, gotta t- no. <laughs> <laughs> I know how that worked. <laughs> um. It's simply a way to identify victory. So here's what I want you to think about today. I know most of you are just watching the Super Bowl probably for the commercials, right? But I hope whatever your Super Bowl celebration is today, that you'll at least take a few moments and watch the trophy presentation at the end. Because the trophy presentation will be given to some team. Recognition will be given to some person. And basically what they're acknowledging is the goal, the victory that you're being recognized for today is the victory that every team in the NFL wanted when the season started. And it can be a long season with all kinds of things happen that you never predict and injuries and things that but basically it's a matter of persevering and that's really what James is saying and so if you're in the midst of a hardship a difficult situation if you find yourself asking why is this happening to me and where are you God I pray today that you can take with you this simple word where James says, blessed are you. Blessed are you, the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that Jesus has promised. And maybe you can just envision yourself at some point what can cause you to rejoice is you envision I'm in the midst of the hardship now I'm in the battle now but my Lord I recognize the Lord and my Lord has told me that there's a day coming where I get to step up on the platform not as Lord not as royalty not as somehow like I'm the one but simply to receive a crown from the one who is Lord Who's going to say to me, you won. You were victorious. You persevered. And here's why this is going to be so important. If you do, in fact, get to that point and you persevere, once the crown is put on and you look up at Jesus, you're going to realize, I look a lot more like him than I did when I started. And once you understand God's purpose, that that's what God's been trying to accomplish all along, I hope you can find cause to rejoice. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the opportunity to present your word. I pray, God, that I've been able to do so in a way that you can use to further your purpose. God, thank you as we have celebrated today around these tables what Christ did for us and that because of his death and resurrection we can have hope and new life. And God, I especially pray for those who right now find themselves struggling in the midst of hardship. 
And as we open your word and read these words about consider it pure joy when you find times of testing and trial that maybe upon first hearing that they just think, what are you talking about? God, I pray through your spirit moving, through your word being presented that today you have been able to speak a word of encouragement, a word of hope. So that when we find ourselves in the midst of those places and we're asking why, we can hear you speak in that still small voice so that you might be glorified in us. So that we might become more like Jesus. And God, when we ask that question, where are you? May we hear you speak to us in this place that you're right here with us working to accomplish good. Working to overcome evil with good. God, thank you that you are indeed a very present help in times of trouble. May you do the good work that you desire in us this day as we pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.